Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, complete streets and about community action and uh, sort of two pieces to that, but I'll try and bring them together. Um, first of all, I'm sure you're all familiar, uh, last week over a 24-hour period in Toronto, uh, there were 11 uh, separate uh, pedestrian uh, injuries and collisions and various different events. Uh, two people died, nine people were injured. Um, you know, it was one of these kind of random clusters of events, but um, certainly in the details of each event, it highlighted some of the challenges that Toronto has with uh, its existing cycling infrastructure. This was the, uh, the Toronto Star's editorial following the event. Uh, they said, let's be careful out there. Um, the research from, from, from every high reliability industry is that telling people to be more careful doesn't work. Um, we've got a quote here from uh, James Baggian, who was a uh, NASA astronaut, uh, process materials engineer. Uh, he was actually safety director for the Veterans Hospital, and uh, so he just talked a couple of years ago, not about cycling infrastructure specifically, but he said, tell people to be careful is not effective. Humans are not reliable that way. Uh, you need a solution that's not about making people perfect. And so this idea that, oh, cyclists need to be more careful, pedestrians need to be more careful, this is not the right way to create complete livable streets. Um, what does work is that we have to design our streets to be inherently safe. And what I mean by that is that the streets are designed to, let's keep hitting this thing, they have to, I wave my hands while I'm talking, uh, they have to be designed to contain uh, and restrict the, the motion of the most dangerous elements of the street, which of course are the motor vehicles. Uh, the street has to have an increased tolerance for error uh, in the sense that, you know, if a person does step out onto the street or, you know, ride the wrong, if you do the kind of things that people do on a routine basis, uh, the punishment for that isn't uh, injury and death. So, first of all, what's traffic? Uh, traffic, you know, usually when we say traffic, we talk about traffic report. You know, traffic means cars, right? But traffic isn't cars, traffic is people. Traffic is people trying to get from somewhere to somewhere else um, through whatever means are available. It can be driving, it can be walking, it can be cycling. Um, and so we have to kind of break out of this idea that traffic is cars, traffic is people. And when we start thinking about that, then it starts to open us up a little bit more to ways we can design our streets uh, around being able to get from somewhere to somewhere else in a sensible way, rather than just designing for the car. Um, so what's a complete street? Um, and I'm sure this is probably not going to be a shocker to anybody. Uh, it's a street that allows people to travel in a variety of different ways, different modes, as transportation engineers call it. Uh, it's a street that makes space for everyone, not just drivers. Uh, it's a street that brings people into contact. Um, you know, if you look think of highways and limited access streets, they're designed to prevent people from coming into contact because when you have a ton of steel traveling at 60 or 70 kilometers an hour, um, a contact is disastrous. A person walking down the street, contact is often delightful. Uh, and similarly, we have to find a balance between different modes, specifically when we're transitioning our current streets, which are overwhelmingly designed for cars, into complete streets that make room for everybody. Uh, so some characteristics of a complete street. We've got uh, wide sidewalks, uh, easy pedestrian crossings. Um, you know, there's a, a horrible stretch of Main Street uh, east of downtown where you're walking for 1,500 meters, 2,000, you know, two kilometers in between a signalized intersection. And the city of Hamilton has a policy, which I don't understand, of uh, not painting crosswalks. We've allowed them just to fade to nothing. And what I was told by legal is that uh, the city's afraid that if we paint crosswalks and somebody tries to use it and get hit, the city uh, will be liable. So instead, we have phantom crosswalks that sort of fade away, make everybody confused. Um, uh, complete streets have uh, fewer and narrower driving lanes. You know, unlike the five lanes we have on Main Street, um, there might be two lanes dedicated to automobiles and a lot more space allocated to bike lanes, to wider sidewalks, uh, you know, to uh, bulb outs and bump outs that bring the two sides of the street closer together so pedestrians have a shorter distance to cross. Uh, and then finally, complete streets have places to meet up. So let's take a look at a few pictures of that. Here is sort of a before and after shot of uh, a street that had like four car lanes and then had room for everybody. So you see there's curbside parking, there's bike lanes, there's trees, there's wide sidewalks. Uh, here's a bit of a close up, you know, again, some characteristics. You have a sidewalk in which more than one person can walk abreast. 
unlike a lot of Hamilton's sidewalks where I can't actually walk beside my nine-year-old, you sort of have to go to Kitty Corner. Mm -hmm. um, you've got bike lanes that are dedicated on the street, uh, preferably protected and physically separated from the cars. Um, you've got you know slower and narrower traffic lanes, and uh, another big part of it is uh, trees. Trees are wonderful. Trees are, are, uh, are a great way of humanizing uh, an environment. They provide shade, they're cooling in the summer, uh, and they also send a psychological signal to drivers to slow down. That's uh, a really big part of these sort of, you know, trees parked on either side of the, of the street kind of form an archway, and uh, what they signal is that this is not a thoroughfare. Uh, this is actually uh, a square in uh, the center of Carcassonne in the south of France. Um, it looks suspiciously like Gore Park, except that it has people in it. <laughs> and, uh, and it's actually in the very center of, of a very, very central downtown core area, which is more or less car free. Uh, so, what complete streets do, the, you know, these design things that I've talked about, what they do is they reduce automobile speeds, and I'll talk some more about that in a minute. Uh, they encourage people to walk, they encourage people to ride bikes, and uh, they also encourage people to meet up. I won't get into it. Uh, tonight because I've only got so much time, but there's a whole body of research about the economic benefits of, uh, of, a, of a city that's designed so that people can randomly bump into each other. It turns out that there is a huge boost to the rate of innovation by a variety of measures when you have an environment that brings people into this kind of serendipitous contact. Um, some of the benefits of complete streets, uh, they're safer for all users. Not just for pedestrians and cyclists, but actually safer for drivers as well. This is one of the most interesting things, is that you put a bike lane on the street, that street becomes safer for drivers. Um, obviously, you've got improved public health, um, you know, uh, people walking, people cycling, people being active. Uh, you're going to have lower levels of obesity, lower levels of heart disease, lower levels of diabetes. I mean, it's, and, and there's actually quite a lot of very strong, that's not just a theoretical thing. Uh, I'll mention a little bit uh, along a, a study that was done in Toronto about that. Um, increased neighborhood interaction, which uh, you know not only is good for the economy, but is also good for quality of life. I know I live in Kirkendall, and um, I walk through it routinely, and I'm constantly bumping into people. And it's actually really nice to be walking down the street and to meet someone and have a stop and chat. It just, it's it's uh, it's uh, an element of, of quality of life that I frankly wouldn't want to give up. Uh, it supports local business, which uh, again I'll talk about a bit more, um, and it improves quality of life. So. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little, a little bit more in specific about speed. One of the things that, uh, that most people, I think, don't really get is that a vehicle going twice as fast actually has four times the kinetic energy. The energy of the vehicle is related to the square of the speed. It's not linear. Uh, it also has four times the stopping distance. Um, and uh, the way that plays out in the data, this is a study from the UK Department of Transport, and they found that at 32 kilometers an hour, if a vehicle hits a pedestrian, the pedestrian has a 5% chance of dying. Uh, at 48 kilometers an hour, that increases to 45%. And at 64 kilometers an hour, which is pretty much the front of the green wave along Main Street, uh, the pedestrian has an 85% chance of dying. It's absolutely staggering. The, uh, the correlation between vehicle speed and, and danger to pedestrians is huge. So uh, this is an interesting, this just came out this week. Uh, the New York City uh, Department of Transportation did a study on the protected bike lanes they built on 8th and 9th Street. And uh, what they found was a 35% decrease in injuries to all street users, again, motorists as well as pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, massive, uh, uh, that's sorry, 35% uh, decrease on 8th Avenue, 56% uh, decrease on 9th Avenue, and a significant increase in retail sales on those streets. Uh, they found that across, um, uh, across the, uh, the, the whole city, there was about a 3% increase in business over the past couple of years. On these two streets, it was almost a 50% increase. Um, Here's uh, the Jarvis Street bike lanes were mentioned previously. The, um, the Trump City of Toronto did a study and they found uh, the number of cyclists tripled after they put in the bike lanes. Um, cyclists actually made up 10% of uh, the modal share on the street. Um, the average rush hour commute time for automobiles went up an intolerable two minutes. Uh, that was for rush hour, by the way, rest of the day, it was brief long traffic. Uh, the number of collisions dropped by 23%. Um, and the fiscally responsible council who voted to remove them are going to pay $300,000 to take them out so they can put in an additional swing lane down the middle. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about two-way traffic specifically, uh, just because it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And anyone who lives downtown Hamilton probably knows why. Um, one-way <coughs> streets are designed for speed. They're designed as thoroughfares. They're designed to get through as quickly as possible. Um, and they're also designed in such a way that as a driver, you sort of feel like you're in a controlled um, environment that's you know, somewhat limited access. It feels a bit like driving on a highway. When you're on a highway, you don't have to worry about cyclists, you don't have to worry about pedestrians, you don't have to worry about all these distractions, and so you tend to go. And of course, uh, that's devastating for the safety of other road users. Um, Another thing that a lot of researchers found that uh, with one-way streets, if you want to get, if you're on a street going this way and you want to get to a destination on a street going that way, you're now making like two or three turns to get there. Well, every intersection turn is an increased opportunity to come into disastrous contact with pedestrians. Now, there was a study published in 2000 in the Canadian Journal of Public Health uh, using Hamilton data, and they found that children on one-way streets were two and a half more times, uh, two and a half times more likely to be injured than children on two-way streets. Um, so the, the data is pretty strong, it's pretty, pretty frightening. Um, so there's some real benefits uh, you know, that I think Hamilton can enjoy from, from two-way streets specifically. Uh, better storefront visibility for uh, retail businesses. Uh, motorists can approach from either direction. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and there have been studies from cities all across North America. Basically Hamilton was one of well over 100 cities that converted its downtown streets en masse to one way in the mid-1950s, it was a whole movement. Um, it was an engineer uh, named Wilbur Smith who had come up with this concept of maximizing traffic flow, and he peddled it to all comers, and uh, Hamilton, like many other places, decided to go with this. Uh, a huge number of other cities have since given up because they decided that it was disastrous. We're holding on trying to look at that. Uh, so this was a business owner quoted in The Spectator in May 1957. He said, our windows are no good nowadays. People have no time to stop and look. Nobody comes from the west end of the city anymore. We would like to see King Street two-way once more. This is a King Street business owner uh, from May 2012. Try telling someone to find our store from the west end. It's a complex set of directions, wastes both time and gas, creates more travel, and really thwarts our accessibility to customers. For a retailer, making it hard for customers is never a good thing. So, you know, 50, 60 years later, the business owners are still telling us exactly the same thing they were telling us literally months after our streets were converted. Um, also, Hamilton has uh, a, a developing uh, plan to build a light rail system uh, running east-west from McMaster to Eastgate. Uh, a couple of years ago, Metrolinx did a study and they did benefits case analysis and they found that converting Maine and King and Cannon to two-way will support the success of the LRT system. Earlier this year, the McMaster Institute of Logistics and Transportation and Logistics did a study on LRT, and uh, they also found that if the city converts its streets to two-way, it will support the success of LRT. It will support uh, the goal of getting more new investment coming in. Uh, it will support better modal shift. Um, uh, incidentally, they also said that, this is, that the LRT project needs a political champion. Um, so, uh, one of the arguments against two-way streets is that it'll magically create gridlock, even though uh, we'd have the same number of lanes and in fact twice as many ways of getting to places. Um, the research absolutely does not support this assertion. Um, cities, again, across North America and around the world have converted one-way streets to two-way. They've reduced lane capacity, they've taken out lanes. And uh, what they found is that a lot of the traffic on a street is what's called induced traffic. If you make it really, really easy to drive, more people will drive longer distances more frequently. If you make it harder to drive, people will drive less. If you make it easier to ride a bike, more people will ride a bike. It's, it's, it's a basic law of economics. The easier you make it to do something, uh, the more the demand will be there for it. So when you reduce the supply of driving lanes, the number of drivers goes down as well, and a lot of the traffic, as engineers say, disappears. Uh, so this is not going to read this, but it's a list of cities that are converting the streets to two-way across the United States and Canada right now. Um, Hamilton, you know, with a few sort of small incremental exceptions, is not really one of those cities. Um, our downtown is still dominated by multiple one-way streets with, with lots and lots of lanes, all barreling in the same direction, high vehicle speeds, very few and fragmentary bike lanes, uh, narrow sidewalks uh, with very few pedestrian crossings. 
here's Main Street. Uh, thank goodness there are five lanes, because otherwise, where would all the cars go? Um, this is the kind of thing we have to put up with walking in the city. Uh, there's lots of intersections where uh, you have a situation where drivers really want to be able to turn, and pedestrians aren't allowed to get in their way. This is at the corner of King and um, King and Dunder. Uh, by the way, the, that corner there, uh, the northwest corner is a residential neighborhood, and the southwest corner is a grocery store. And if you want to walk to the grocery store, you have to make three crossings to get to it. It's, uh, it's uh, absolutely absurd. Um, and the thing is, we already know what to do. This was uh, a mock-up that was done uh, by a graphic design firm. It, it basically took a photograph of Main Street and then overlaid what a complete street might look like. So they've got curbside parking, one lane in each direction, uh, a protected, separated by plane, street trees, wider sidewalks. Uh, this wouldn't be that hard to do, and we already know how to do it. Uh, incidentally, we did it in, uh, on Wilson Street in Ancaster, and uh, the councillor was delighted to show off the complete walkable, multimodal access that uh, downtown Ancaster got for its street. Um, now, in terms of policy direction, our policy direction points overwhelmingly to complete streets. Going back to 1992, we had Vision 2020, which, uh, you know, firm urban boundary, complete streets, mixed use, infill, density, all the kind of things that we're talking about. Um, 1996, um, architecture Hamilton did a downtown ideas charrette, and they came out and they said, two-way streets, infill, mixed use, you know, all the same kind of thing. Uh, 2001, our transportation plan was called Putting People First. I sometimes imagine the city with a giant piece of lead shot putting people <laughs> out of the way because uh, that was 11 years ago. Uh, 2005, we had our grids, uh, the growth-related integrated development strategy, and it had nine uh, grids directions. One of them was um, expanding transportation options that encourage travel by foot, bike and transit, and enhance efficient interregional transportation connections. So in our, our official plan, that's one of the core values that we're supposed to be uh, working towards. Uh, 2007, our transportation master plan continues with the same theme. Uh, needless to say, it's been studied to death. That's not even to mention the province and places to grow and the kind of direction we're getting from them. Um, in 2002, this is just sort of a snapshot of where we are, but um, they did actually, they actually did a pretty comprehensive traffic study and they found that 40% of vehicles were speeding on minor arterial streets like Charlton and Herkimer. Uh, 200 vehicles a day were exceeding 65 kilometers an hour, which as we know, means that any pedestrians they hit are going to have an excellent chance of dying from it. And uh, they also found that most Duran streets had a lot of excess capacity. You can actually remove lane capacity uh, without even, you know, without impinging. You know, you can still have free flow in traffic. Uh, so this is a, a parade of some of the uh, experts, you know, transportation engineers, planners, architects who come to Hamilton uh, from other places to tell us what we already know. Um, we've got the World Health Organization telling us that the vulnerability of the human body needs to be the limiting factor. You know, again, that brings us back to speed, right? You know, if uh, a vehicle hits you and it's going fast, it's going to kill you. We need to design our streets for the human beings who we want to occupy them. Uh, similarly, the Ontario coroner put a report on pedestrian deaths and concluded that we need to focus on complete streets. Uh, this was a study that was done in Toronto, uh, quite remarkable. Instead of um, looking at the prevalence of diabetes, they actually basically took the entire population of Toronto and looked at the incidence so this is new cases of diabetes over a period of time. And what they found was that people living in areas that had low walkability were much more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than people who lived in areas that had high walkability. And that that was disproportionately affecting uh, recent immigrants to Canada. Um, this was a study done in April 1986. Uh, and they found, uh, this was, um, I can't remember what city this is, I'm sorry, but uh, they found that people living in one-way streets uh, essentially reorganize their lives in order to avoid exposure to the street, uh, which of course reduced neighborhood interaction, uh, reduced eyes on the street, and reduced their own personal public health because they're no longer walking around. Um, Hamilton Chamber of Commerce is uh, also recognizing that walkability is not just something that's nice to have, but should actually be regarded as economic infrastructure. This is, uh, they see walkability as something that, that generates employment, that creates new businesses. So. Uh, we have a downtown transportation master plan. It was approved in uh, 2001, reviewed in 2008. Um, most of the streets that were on the list haven't been converted, and there's no budget to convert them. 
Uh, this is just a, a schedule, as you can see, um, several of these are outstanding, some of them were removed completely. Um, the uh, King and Bay and Hunter, you know, the, 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 the pending LRT, uh, one of the problems with that is that we're, we're being told we can't do anything with those streets until LRT, oh, and it's going to be at least 10 years till we get LRT. Mm -hmm. So we've essentially put those streets into suspended animation until that time. So this is the challenge that we have, and uh, you, know, you mentioned this uh, in a question earlier. We've got strong policy direction dating back to the early 1990s. We've got a, an overwhelming weight of evidence. Uh, we have the guide and direction of expert planners, um, you know, consultants coming in, you know, who have expertise doing this in other places, um, and something, something else. Anybody know what we're missing? Any ideas? Okay, so there's an outcry, sure. Case studies? Uh, well, we have lots of case studies. Oh, oh yeah, Hamilton, yeah, I mean, that, that um, the study on, uh, on children was, uh, uh, was, was using Hamilton data. Uh, what we're missing is leadership. And uh, uh, so, you know, you mentioned that, that our counselors seem to be very reluctant to kind of take the plunge on this. And I think the reasons is that there's kind of a generalized resistance to change. You know, people are, are, are afraid of, um, they're afraid of stepping into the unknown. There's, there's a fear of failure. You know, I mean, politics is, is very, the, the horizons are short, you know, and the, the punishment for doing the wrong thing is swift and brutal. Um, there's a certain measure of ideology, you know, partisanship. There's kind of an idea that, you know, this is not something that we need to be worrying about. Um, and there's also some matters of personality. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the Jarvis Street um, vote, uh, despite the fact that the evidence overwhelmingly supported that there was no significant impact to driving and a major positive impact to cycling and a major positive impact in terms of safety for everyone, they still voted to shut the lanes down. This was not a decision that was based on, on evidence. It was based on, on essentially, uh, lashing out. It was a vindictive kind of a measure. Um, uh, sorry, did you want to? Plus, property values are higher on two-way streets than they are on one-way streets. So, uh, property the values? Dollars in your pocket. Your value of your property is much higher. Quite a bit higher. Okay, so property value is higher on two-way streets. Another thing, too, I'd rather get hit in front of the Sheridan Hotel by a bicycle who will probably catch me because he'll, he'll kind of lead into me and protect me. I'm not going to get bruises, but I'm not going to have 4,000 pounds rolling over me at any speed. So, so you're safer, really, on a bike if you bike it. Absolutely. Well, every person on a bike is not in the car, and that's, that's the right. way they have to be. <laughs> oh, yes? Uh, what kind of feedback do the businesses give council on the one-way streets? Uh, I'm actually uh, just about to get to that. It's, uh, it has been, um, so I'm just going to jump to that bit. Uh, so what, what we're hearing from um, the, uh, the downtown BIA doesn't have an official position on two-way conversion, but if you ask them, they'll refer to a survey they did of their members in 2002, and the response they got was that businesses were very happy with the conversion. Uh, they saw business went up, uh, property values went up, some businesses hired new employees because uh, their sales have increased to that point. Um, the International Village BIA is doing, they're polling their members right now, but the, uh, the executive director is Susan Braithwaite. She strongly supports the two-way conversion. But they, they're doing their due diligence to make sure that when they speak on behalf of, on behalf of the members, that it's a, um, that's a united voice. Certainly a lot of, of um, uh, like creative businesses downtown are very much in support of this. Uh, so, how do we how do we how do you change a council that has a lot of reasons for not wanting to do this and uh, and not a lot of reason to do it? How do you how do you how do you get from having the right policy and the right information and the right evidence and the experts telling us this? How do you make that actually happen? And I think I don't know for sure what the answer is, uh, but a few years ago we went through a process in Hamilton uh, in trying to uh, organize and argue in support of LRT. And when we started in 2007, nobody was talking about LRT. Nobody knew, understood what it was. Nobody liked the idea very much. And so we built uh, an argument that was based on evidence, you know, based on creating a clear 
uh, narrative about the kind of city that we wanted to see and how this would support uh, developing the city in that way. Uh, we used uh, you know, a very evidence-based approach. We used comparisons to other cities. You know, uh, we answered the kinds of objections that we were hearing. And we went and talked to everybody who would listen to us. So we went to neighborhood associations, community councils, um, business improvement areas, um, you know, uh, service clubs. Uh, I mean, just you know, we basically just talked to every organization we could find, and we did presentations. We went to the chamber of commerce, we went to the home builders, and uh, over a period of, of probably a couple of years of just steady, ongoing engagement. Uh, public opinion in Hamilton really started to shift. The newspaper editorially began to support it. Chamber of Commerce came to support it. The uh, Builders Association supported it. Neighborhood associations across the city were supporting it. And what that did was it allowed council to sort of feel like they weren't taking such a big risk. Right? They could see the case for it. They weren't getting a lot of flack against it. And it allowed them to be courageous. And I think we need to do the same thing for complete streets. We need to start organizing at the grassroots level. We need to build a strong, compelling, evidence-based narrative that, uh, that again, describes the kind of city that we want and the benefits that will accrue to everybody if we achieve that. And then we need to start reaching out to every single group and community and area that will listen to us in the city. And when councillors start hearing you know, from people living on you know, Garth Street that, uh, yeah, this is what we need to be doing. I think this is a good thing. You know, I want downtown to be healthy. I want to be able to work down there or to go there, maybe even move there again. Uh, that's when we'll see council take the plunge. Until then, they have too much to lose and they feel they don't have enough to gain. So, uh, you know, we need to engage them respectfully. You know, saying you guys are idiots, not a great way to build a positive dialogue. Um, we need to challenge those kind of ideologies and those reflexive kind of, oh no, that can't work. We need to challenge that with clear evidence, which means we need to make sure we're doing our homework. Uh, we need to build, you know, again, a broad coalition of support. So it's not just people downtown, it's people in groups throughout the city who are saying, yes, this is a vision that we share and we can support. Uh, and we need to ultimately reduce the risk of politicians. And then finally, we need nine councillors to get something passed. We don't need to convince every single councillor. We just need to convince the majority of them. Um, and hopefully we won't end up with a situation where councillors are able to exercise a veto. Can you imagine if downtown councillors were able to exercise a veto on one-way streets? You would have a very different shape of downtown. But yeah, councillors on the mountain are saying, um, you know, we want to be able to tell you what your street should look like. Oh, and we also don't want you telling us what our streets should look like. So there's, there's a really uh, double standard. And, and it has to do with the fact that we regard automobiles and automobile infrastructure as necessary, and we regard everything else as you know, kind of hokey. So, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, support is starting to grow. Um, we've got three councillors downtown who uh, support it, and two are actively <coughs> working towards that. Um, we, when the councillor, uh, Farr and McCaddy, when they brought their motion forward to create an implementation force, um, I put out a call, I think their meeting was on Tuesday, and it was the Tuesday after Labor Day, and on the Friday I put out a call and said, hey, now is the time, write a letter in, get it included in the agenda to express support for, uh, for two-way streets and for this initiative. And 84 people wrote in, uh, three people wrote in saying, no, don't, keep it as one-way streets, and the rest of them all wrote in support. So it, that's 81 people over a long weekend at the end of summer who, you know, and not just, not just like one sentence, but like long, thoughtful, deliberate votes. There's a lot of people who really care a lot about this, and uh, we need to figure out how to, uh, how, to, how to take that kind of to the next level of engagement. Um, again, a number of neighborhood associations uh, throughout the lower city, Beasley, Central, Durand, they're all coming out in North End Neighbors, and they're strongly, strongly supporting, as, at an organizational level, complete streets, uh, slowing down the speeding cars, creating more safe places for cycling, more safe places for walking, and more livable neighborhoods. Um, you know, again, the BIAs, uh, they are, are broadly in support. And the Chamber of Commerce is looking at two-way conversion. They're kind of torn between, on the one hand, the members of the uh, Chamber who have trucking companies and want to drive through the city really fast. The ones who have businesses downtown maybe are more interested in livability. So there's an internal struggle <coughs> happening there. Um, one of the things that I'm uh, working on is um, we're trying to create basically a community-based uh, volunteer organization 
like what we did for light rail, that will develop um, an argument and a narrative in support of complete streets and uh, will then start essentially having people armed with a, a presentation and with information that they can then go and start meeting with community groups throughout the city. And we can start trying to, uh, to build that broad base of support so that councillors don't feel like they're going to get hammered with angry letters if they, if they get on board with this. And uh, if you're interested, we've got an email list that you can follow. It's uh, bit.ly uh, slash two hyphen way hyphen Hamilton. And uh, you know, it's early days. We're still in the process of kind of getting organized, figuring out who's going to be involved in building this. And this presentation I've done tonight is like a really early, early alpha version of what we may eventually bring out. And I'm hoping it'll be a lot better once we get the inclusion of a lot more people and a lot more people with more expertise than I have talking about this stuff and figuring out how we can you know, make it visually better, how we can make it more, uh, uh, more tightly integrated and, and more cohesive. So anyone who's interested in getting involved, I know there's a lot of people in this room who are very passionate and very well informed about this. We need all the help we can get. And uh, that's all I have.
for Queen Street and for Ken. So the traditional environmental assessment is you get a consultant, and no, not, nothing against consultants because there are some excellent consultants, but if you have uh, a class environmental assessment that's done using kind of a form, um, no one actually is walking on the street as you know, as you guys talked about, actually going and experiencing the environment. Uh, if it's done kind of at a very abstract push and papery kind of a level, we're not too sure what's gonna come out of it. So they wanna organize uh, a grassroots environmental assessment where you actually have a team of people walking the streets from one end to the other and marking, okay, we're gonna to have to do a curb cut here. We're gonna to have to look at the parking issue here. We're gonna to have to see how to go about reconfiguring this intersection. So they want it to be very citizen-based and very uh, participatory. So that's another opportunity to get involved. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, I really appreciate it.